Okay, thank you, Deborah, and, and also thank you to Holly for being an organizer and inviting me to give this talk. So, um, you know, first I'd like to say I was really very impressed by the talks by Sheila, Dave, and Alex. Um, it was really wonderful. So that that made me dig a little deeper to try to have something worth saying today. And so what I'm going to do, I, I, I'm, I'm tackling the same problem they were tackling of how to um, assess vaccine FC, well, in my case, vaccine FC, how to assess prevention FC versus a counterfactual placebo. Um, and I'm going to focus on using an immune marker mediator. Um, and, and this uh, talk is closely related to recent work with Yui and Marco uh, for a manuscript we've submitted. And, and, and you'll see some connections to that work in, in, in this talk. The reason I'm focusing on an immune marker mediator approach is because if you look at the history of vaccine development, immune markers have all, often been successfully used for approval of vaccines. Um, there's, there's many examples where vaccines have been approved based on an immune marker surrogate endpoint that's been established and accepted by regulatory agencies. Typically, uh, regulators distinguish between a validated surrogate, which is a biomarker scientifically well-established to reliably predict vaccine efficacy, and a non-validated surrogate, which is reasonably likely to predict vaccine efficacy, but not yet scientifically well-established. Um, basically, if it's established, and th then it can be used for traditional approval. So, so one can do a study in, in only seven, several hundred vaccinees, and based on meeting a pre-specified benchmark on, say, an antibody immune marker, uh, a vaccine can be approved. And, and this is used for many vaccines. For example, the seasonal flu vaccine every year is licensed based on an immune marker. And in the future, I, I suspect that's gonna be happening for the SARS-2 vaccines as well. This slide is from former FDA CBER director, Norman Baylor, which really was his synthesis of Stanley Plotkin's slide. But this is for 14 different vaccines, immune markers that were accepted for approval of vaccines ba based on using um, a, a threshold of, of protection. So, so I wanted to start by saying that an immune marker could be promising in general for, for vaccines. Um, and, and, and typically that immune marker is, is a, a binding antibody response to, to the vaccine insert or um, some functional response like a neutralizing, neutralizing antibody response. So now let's move to our topic of HIV vaccine FC trials. And I'm really focusing on vaccines today. Um, uh, so there's been seven vaccine FC trials that have been completed over about a 20 plus year period. Um, we know that no vaccines are approved. One vaccine showed partial efficacy. That was an all vac tb one twenty platform vaccine. And it's not clear what the path forward for that platform could be give, given that um, uh, another FC trial 702 did not show efficacy of, of that type of platform vaccine. And there's three different vaccine FC trials ongoing, PrepVac, which Sheila talked about, and then 705 and 706, which are partnerships between Janssen and uh, the HVTN for ad 26 platform, vector platform vaccines. So what could be the next vaccine FC trial after these ongoing trials? So if, if none of the vaccines work, then it may be that we'll need some breakthrough in a candidate vaccine uh, with, with markedly improved imagicity to have solid justification for the next FC trial. For, for example, we might need a vaccine that, that gives um, an order of magnitude greater uh, induction of CD8 T cell breadth, or we might need um, continuing breakthroughs in the ability to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies. The, the AMP trial is showing us that um, in the future, neutralizing antibody titer probably can be a, a good immune marker. And once we get a vaccine that's inducing um, broad and strong neutralizing antibodies, um, then, then an FC trial would probably be quite well justified. And then also for non-neutralizing vaccines, I think if we get an order of magnitude improvement in the FC effector function antibody and T cell breadth, then, then that could be warranted as well. And as I've heard Holly say in multiple forums, and I agree with, um, for vaccines before there's any approvals, um, a placebo controlled trial is is one of the um, you know potentially feasible designs, whereas as usual the 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 proper uh, standard of prevention for all participants is is a critical area for for and building up. Now, if uh, if some of the vaccines work partially but not well enough to be approved, 
then again, I think placebo controlled VE trials in the future could be feasible. And then thirdly, if, uh, if one of the vaccines works and is approved, then in some populations, probably a placebo controlled trial wouldn't be feasible. And then we would be in the situation of an active comparison design. And, and so this is just brief context. For the rest of this talk, I'm really gonna focus on the active comparison design setting. And in that setting, I'm going to consider two approaches for assessing vaccine FC versus counterfactual placebo based on an immune marker mediator. And so these active comparison trials, they could have many shapes and forms. It, it could be an approved vaccine versus a new candidate vaccine, could be head-to-head -head candidate vaccines that are both new, or, or there could be an incorporation of a, a non-vaccine prevention modality in, in one of the interventions. So in these active comparison designs, um, of course, we can directly estimate the rate of HIV infection in, in, in each of these vaccine arms. And so this is already highly enriched data compared to what's been used for approval of uh, some vaccines in the past where uh, you, you just need the immune marker endpoint in, in the vaccine arms. Um, but of course, we have the challenge that we're trying to estimate vaccine FC of each active vaccine arm versus the counterfactual placebo without having a placebo arm in, in this active comparison design. So really the structure of this is the same as the DISCOVER trial, um, which had two oral PrEP arms. Okay, now getting into the statistics. So the notation I'll use, uh, and this is for the new vaccine FC trial, the active comparison trial, the, the, the new data are um, randomization assignment to vaccine or, or counterfactual placebo, baseline covariates W, um, R is the indicator of measuring the immune marker at a fixed time tau post-vaccination, and S is the immune marker at that time tau. And then Y is the indicator of HIV infection diagnosis after the marker is measured through some follow-up time, such as two years. We also considered a previous vaccine FC trial that did have a placebo arm. So that could be, say, the 7 to 5 or 7 to 6 trial. So our objective is estimation and inference of vaccine efficacy, one minus the um, basically the infection rate, vaccine versus placebo. And, and I'm using um, potential outcomes notation here. And the first approach I'll consider, we only use the data from the new trial, and we assume the immune marker is a perfect mediator of vaccine FC in this trial. And then the second approach relaxes that and also uses the data from the previous trial and uses a constancy assumption that the degree of mediation of the marker is the same in the previous trial and in the new trial. So mediation, so this part of the talk is really a brief primer on uh, you know, mediation 101. You, you know, this is um, ordinary stuff for mediation. So, so mediation is in terms of natural causal effect. Uh, we define the natural direct effect and the natural indirect effect. Um, the natural direct effect is expressing um, how much the outcome would change if we're vaccinating someone versus uh, what their immune marker would be if we basically delete the vaccination and set them to placebo. So it's natural in that it's, it's what the immune response naturally would have been uh, had they gotten placebo. The natural direct effect is asking, what is the vaccine FC if the immune response pathway is, is deactivated? Basically taking a vac uh, vaccine recipient and uh, setting their um, antibody response to zero. And then the indirect effect, that's the effect of vaccination through the marker. Um, so it's, it's the effect of vaccination that operates by changing the immune response marker. And we have a decomposition that we can write the, the overall vaccine FC parameter of interest um, basically is the product of these NDEs and NIEs. And then we can write down a proportion of the vaccine FC mediated through the marker. And PM equals one means perfect mediation. And that occurs if and only if the, the natural direct effect is one. So in other words, all the vaccine FC is through the, the marker. Formal mediation analysis has not been used much for correlates assessment in vaccine studies, but recently, our friend Chechen Chechen has been doing this for flu vaccines. For example, uh, this is a paper that, that he wrote with colleagues where the proportion of the vaccine is mediated by the HAA titer was estimated to be 57%. So I think this is now kind of a, it's gonna be a normative approach to, a normative part of the toolkit of assessing correlates. And, and, and we're doing this in the COVID uh, statistical analysis plan, for example. Okay, so what are the requirements for this immune marker mediator method to be worth considering at all? Uh, and 
So the first is we do need to have some knowledge that an immune marker is likely to mediate a large proportion of the VE. And this could be learned from previous placebo controlled VE trials and also from supportive, more mechanistic studies such as adoptive transfer challenge trials in animals where um, the, the animals are passively, say, infuse the putatively mediating, neutralizing antibody titer, and then they're challenged, and, and we can directly verify that the neutralizing antibody titer is, is um, correlated with protection. And also field trials of monoclonal antibodies, such as the AMP trial, can, can help build um, a case that a marker might be a mediator. And, and again, I think AMP is supporting that neutralizing AMP titer is likely to be a mediator in the future. Um, and then the other thing we require to even attempt using this method is that we need the vaccine arm in the new trial to have a subgroup that has the immune marker levels at a low level that, that are typical for placebo recipients. So, so here I'm showing the ARBON44 trial that, that that did occur. You see these vaccinees, they, they had, um, this happens to be a binding antibody response that were the same as placebo recipients. And then the previous slide, you see in the flu trials, th there are the, this, the subgroup of vaccinees that, that have placebo-like responses. But, and we have a big advantage in HIV vaccine FC trials compared to the flu trials uh, for, for, for um, a, a trying, trying this immune mediator approach. And this advantage is that we're in the constant biomarker scenario. And, and what that means is that in the placebo arm, basically all the placebo recipients have a structural zero because in, in HIV trials, we, enroll, we only enroll people that are HIV negative. And so because they have no um, history of HIV infection, um, their HIV specific immune response is gonna be zero. So this ends up uh, allowing us to equate the natural direct effect to a controlled effect, which, which is convenient for paving the way to an analysis strategy. Okay, so approach one, we're going to assume perfect mediation of the immune marker. This is the counterfactual placebo rate that, that is the challenging part. So this first equality is really just something that always is true. And this second equality is true by the perfect mediation assumption, where basically we're saying that the risk when we uh, take the immune response to what it would be under placebo is the same, whether you're uh, get, are assigned placebo or vaccine. Third equality is because we're in this case constant biomarker scenario. So what this shows is that we can get at our counterfactual placebo risk uh, by estimation of the controlled effect, um, which is, this is the, the risk of HIV infection if we assign the whole study population to get vaccine and also to have their immune response marker set to a value of, of zero. And this is the, the, the kind of classic robbins pearl causal inference type of parameter. So then under um, causal assumptions, we can write, our VE parameter in this way, where, where uh, this denominator, the, the controlled risk, ends up being this marginalized risk. And the assumptions are you know, no unmeasured confounding, positivity, where positivity is really saying that um, we do have a vaccinated subgroup that has um, markers taking value zero. And that's true for all, of, all levels of the baseline covariates that we need to control for, for, for confounding. And then also mediation has, has this additional assumption of no confounders of the mediator outcome relationship. And this parameter here is, is a statistical parameter that we can you know, readily estimate from the, the data in, in, the, in the vaccine study. So to estimate VE, um, under those causal assumptions, it boils down to estimating the overall marginal risk in the vaccine arm and to estimating this marginalized risk for the vaccine arm subgroup with S equals zero. You know, there's obviously many, many ways to estimate this statistical parameter. Um, one can get a regression for the internal term of the conditional risk and then marginalize over the distribution of W. So there's different semi permanent methods that could be used um, or, or non permanent regression such as TMLE. I think in general for these counterfactual placebo methods, uh, it's appropriate to estimate a lower bound for VE. Um, because we're, we're never going to be able to absolutely prove that, that the causal assumptions um, all hold. So, so really, the way I've formulated our task is we need to estimate a lower bound for this uh, term here, this highlighted term. Because if we get a lower bound for that, that's going to translate to a lower bound for vaccine efficacy. 
And we're going to try to do this formally. So, so the way we're going to get a lower bound for this term is we're going to access Ding and Vanderweel's sensitivity analysis framework, which is which is basically the major topic of, of this paper that we just submitted. So I'm going to take a moment to uh, give a thumbnail sketch of what, what is their, their, their very general sensitivity analysis framework. Um, and, and I'm translating their papers into our terminology here, our, our nomenclature here. So, so um, their sensitivity analysis is in terms of risk ratios. So we can define a causal risk ratio as a, a ratio of these controlled risks by setting the whole population to the marker being at value S2 or S1. And then we can estimate a marginalized risk ratio, which, which are just ratios of these marginalized means that, that I've been showing. If, if we correctly control for all the confounders, then, then basically the, the causal risk ratio equals the marginalized risk ratio. But if we miss some, then, then we, there, there's, there, there's gonna be a not equal. What, what they did in their paper is they defined two sensitivity parameters specified by the user, which basically specify the amount of unmeasured confounding that remains after controlling for all the measured confounders. And then they define a bias factor, which is a function of those two sensitivity parameters. And their result is, is a bound that, that the causal risk ratio is bounded above by the marginal risk ratio times this bias factor. It's, it's almost funny that the, the title of their paper was um, sensitive analysis without assumptions. Uh, kind of a bold title, but um, what that means is that this bound holds for any distribution of the measured and, and the unmeasured confounders. So, so it's, it's a general result. Um, so therefore, um, in, in our setting, we're going to typically have marginal risk, marginal risk ratios that are less than one. So it's saying that um, our causal risk ratio can be conservatively estimated by estimating that marginalized risk ratio and multiplying it by the bound. So Ding and Vanderweel's result is for a causal risk ratio, but we need to get a lower bound for um, absolute marginalized risk. And we only need to do this at the S equals zero point. So we need to extend the result a little bit to get at absolute risks. And so I've, I've kind of made up a way to do this. Uh, so I'm gonna let um, S cent be a central value of the marker distribution. I'm gonna define it such that our estimate of marginalized risk is equal to the estimate of the overall risk. Um, and then I'm gonna anchor the analysis by assuming that the causal risk at that central value equals the marginalized risk. And then under this anchoring assumption, uh, Ding and Vanderweel's bounds give us these new bounds, which are in terms of um, the absolute parameters, not, not the, the, the ratios. And so then we're gonna use this bound number two, uh, setting the value S to be, to be zero. And then we, we do some simple math and um, we end up with VE equals one minus uh, the causal risk ratio for um, vaccinees set to marker zero versus vaccinees set to the central marker value. And then we have our bound where we, we replace this causal risk ratio by the marginalized risk ratio times the, the bias factor. And what this formula is showing is that if the immune marker S is a strong inverse correlative risk moving from the, the, the subgroup of the lowest immune responses to those with central immune responses, and that we have a, a small amount of unmeasured confounding, then that's gonna to translate to the vaccine FC being high. So in terms of estimation, you know, we need to estimate this marginalized risk ratio. And, and this is a garden variety statistical problem um, because it's all in terms of statistical parameters. You know, Yu Yi uh, did this work for our paper. And what was done is we specified um, a Cox model for, for this uh, regression of the, the risk of the outcome by some fixed time point conditional on S and W. And then we apply G computation using inverse probably weighting to, to account for the fact that the marker is only measured in, in a subsample. And, and Marco is interested in extending um, previous work he did with Ted Wessling to um, a, an approach that models this assuming causal monotonicity. Right, basically leveraging efficiency from monotonicity. For data analysis, we to apply this immune marker mediator method, we need to specify this bias term for the, the zero point versus the central point, um, which, which boils down to we need to specify these two sensitivity parameters. And not going through the details of these parameters, but I think the, the key point I wanna make is that the specification of the amount of unmeasured confounding depends on context. 
So if, if we knew that our study did a great job of collecting the baseline factors that, that were the key risk factors for HIV infection, and we can control for all those in, in, in our um, estimation, then we might be able to specify uh, you know, a relatively small amount of potential bias around measured confounding. Versus a study that didn't collect any baseline factors, we might need to specify a larger um, degree of potential unmeasured confounding. So I'm going to illustrate uh, a data analysis, uh, and, and Yuyi kindly, you know, um, analyze the data. So two phase three vaccine FC trials were done, the CID14 and CID15 trials. These, these are standard placebo-controlled vaccine FC trials. The overall vaccine FC for these two trials was 56% and 61%. And the immune marker of interest is the month 13 neutralizing antibody titer. And this is showing what the data look like in, in the vaccine and placebo recipients broken down by whether they became a virality confirmed dengue disease case, yes or no. What these pictures show for each trial, the, the blue curves are um, the marginalized risks. Um, and, and here we're actually doing a bit more than what we need for this immune marker approach. We're, we're, we're estimating the controlled risk curve over the full spectrum of neutralizing antibody titer values, S. And, and the blue curve, uh, it's just statist a statistical problem. It's estimating the, mar the, 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 the marginalized risk. Uh, and you see how we get a strong inverse correlate of, of uh, virality confirmed dengue as a function of neutralizing antibody titer. And what the green curve is, that's the analysis that, that uses the, the bounding that, that I showed. And, and so the sensitivity analysis, it forces the curve to be flatter. So it, so it makes the, the correlate um, less sharp. For our purposes with the immune marker mediator, we need to focus on the, the lowest neutralizing titer, titer point where, where the risk was about 5% and the middle uh, antibody point where the risk was a little less than 2%. So basically what we saw is that the, the estimated marginalized risk ratio for those two time two, two marker points of interest was about one third, and that occurred for both trials. Uh, we, we carry out our program. You know, we end up with uh, the, the vaccine efficacy is one minus one third times four third. Four thirds the amount of bias if we if we set the two unmeasured confounding parameters to two. That then we get a, an estimate of 0.56, which is right about on target to what the um, you know the actual empirical efficacy was. So this is at least a, a rough uh, sent uh, a rough illustration that. Um, this approach can get back to recovering vaccine efficacy, although we haven't had time to study this method much. We need to interrogate, does perfect mediation hold? Because these are placebo controlled trials, we can direct, directly assess mediation. So these are the controlled uh, vaccine efficacy curves. And, and what we're interested in is down at the, the, the left side, is vaccine efficacy zero at the bottom? The data are somewhat consistent with that, but, but, but it's you know, not perfect. There, there might be some, some vaccine efficacy that's happening um, even, even in, in people with, with neut some neutralization. Let me very briefly approach two. So it's generally gonna be quite challenging to achieve and prove perfect mediation, because even if we have notionally a perfect mediator, then measurement error may erode the complete mediation be because it's mediation through a measured marker, um, not, not through an underlying latent marker. So our approach two, um, one thing we could do is make a constancy assumption, which is that the natural direct effect in the new trial is the same as that in the old trial. And then the um, approach to estimation and inference is almost the same. It's just now we have to tack on this uh, natural direct effect from the previous trial. And so um, we would you know, use various different mediation methods applied to that placebo controlled trial and um, carry over, propagate the uncertainty of that and, and make inference. Note that um, if the marker is an imperfect mediator, then it's going to tend to make this um, natural direct effect parameter less than one, which is going to tend to make the vaccine FC higher. So approach two is probably going to be a little less conservative. It's, it's going to tend to give us appropriately larger estimates of vaccine FC. Um, but then because we have to also estimate this natural direct effect from the previous trial, it's going to add some uncertainty. Okay, so I'll just wrap up with, um, I think, three slides on uh, discussion. So, you know, I've said that for these attempts at studying prevention efficacy versus counterfactual placebo, that, that it's generally appropriate that estimation and inference should build in formally some conservatism. And so that's one thing we've tried to do by accessing the Ding and Vanderweel paper and, and translating th their general bias approach to, to our, our, our setting. 
And then for approach one, um, there's a feature that I like, which is that um, if, if we have an imperfect mediator, then it's gonna tend to make our estimate of vaccine FC too low. So in other words, our bias is in the right direction if, if, if what we care about is to protect against a false positive. Um, but then this, this, um, this fact also highlights that, that the better the mediator, then the less conservative uh, the estimation is, is going to be. So certainly there's a very potent mediator to, to even a, you know, think about using a method like this. We would want to know that um, the marker probably mediates a, a, a reasonably high proportion of the, the efficacy. Okay, so how do we think about this immune marker mediator approach versus other counterfactual placebo approaches? Firstly, it's only going to apply if there's a subgroup of vaccine recipients that has placebo-like immune responses, uh, because really the, the estimation is anchored on that subgroup. So, so there's some settings where it can't be used. I would certainly conjecture that power and precision will scale with the size of that subgroup. And, and I would also suspect that other methods like, like what Faye is gonna talk about next with recency approaches might, might tend to have more power. But I kind of see this as, I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, suggest this should replace the other methods. I'm more thinking it should maybe also be done alongside the other methods. And then in the future, we can think about ways to synthesize and, and, and develop methods that, that, that try to simultaneously use, use ideas from recency testing or other approaches combined with immune marker mediators. And one thing that could be really great about this immune marker mediator approach is that that makes it complementary toward the other approaches is that, you know, I heard Holly talking through issues at the hiv 4 p meeting and, you know, a challenge posed to the recency testing and the related approach is potential biases, you know, from time differences and incidents between the true counterfactual placebo arm versus the sample for estimating it. And similarly, potential bias from differences in risk factors between the, the true counterfactual placebo arm versus the sample used for estimating it. So the IMM approach, it really, uh, it tries to completely avoid these biases by being based only on the vaccine arm and anchoring the analysis on prior knowledge about a mediator. Okay, uh, last slide. So could this have other applications besides vaccine studies? So in a way, there's nothing really special about the fact I focus on vaccine studies uh, other than the history that, that many immune marker mediators have been accepted for use for approval of, of uh, vaccines. It could apply for prep prevention interventions with S adherence, because it does seem plausible that adherence mediates uh, a reasonably high proportion of the prevention efficacy. You know, if you, if you take someone um, and, and basically set their adherence to zero, then, then I think most would agree that would, you know, bring, bring the prevention efficacy down to zero. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, like Dave's talk, I, I think formally in the background of, of your assumptions that you were um, assuming something about uh, people with low uh, PrEP had no efficacy. It could also apply for uh, monoclonal antibody prevention FC trials. And the approach would readily extend for markers measured longitudinally over time. And then I think it could apply fine for some of the SARS-CoV-2 VE trials. Uh, because some of the vaccine trials, there's actually a large subgroup that has um, really weak neutralization titers that look about the same as the placebo arm. And, and, and it's for those trials where this method could potentially apply. But it probably wouldn't work for like, like the mRNA, Pfizer, and Moderna vaccines, because I think those vaccines are so good that they shoot the immune response so high that there's probably no uh, subgroup with, with a zero response to anchor the analysis. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs>